My name is Ashley. I'm a 66-year-old housewife who has truly entered her golden years. I used to work, but at this age, I really want to enjoy my retirement. My husband Kevin, who is now 67, retired at 65. Following his lead, I retired last year when I turned 65. My relationship with Kevin is neither good nor bad. We got married when I was 25, so we've been together for 41 years. Our days of being madly in love are long over, now, we're more like roommates. Well, it's more peaceful not to interfere with each other too much, and it allows for a laid-back life. Still, I would like to have some conversations, but Kevin's attitude is always cold. Even when I talk about something as simple as my shopping trip or mundane daily events, he snaps. You're noisy. He often sits there with a stern face, watching TV or reading the newspaper. And then suddenly he'll say, I'm going out, and leave by himself. Sometimes I invite him to go shopping together, but Kevin has never once agreed. Even though he's retired and has plenty of time, he's always busy going out on his own. Not being able to go on a trip together, even though we have the time, makes me feel incredibly lonely. Isn't it too much to ask to spend our golden years like this? So I prepared some travel brochures. Hey, how about this place? I said, trying to invite Kevin. I offered to handle all the arrangements and cover the costs if he would just come along. I'm not going. But Kevin still coldly said. Sometimes I think it might be easier if we just divorced and ended our relationship, but I can't make the decision. Even if there's no love left, the bond we've built over the years just can't be easily erased. Our only child, Heather, who is 39 now, says. Why don't you just separate already? But it's not that simple when it comes to marriage. If there was a major turning point, I might be more inclined, but apart from his coldness, I don't have many complaints about Kevin. Kevin does what he likes, but doesn't interfere with what I do. Every day, I wonder if it's right to consider divorce just because we don't spend much time together or have conversations. Maybe getting a part-time job would help distract me? But my dwindling energy doesn't allow for that. I know I'm being indecisive, but this is a dilemma only the person in it can understand. Today, once again, I tried to talk to Kevin. Today, our neighbor Jasmine. But he cut me off with. Shut up, I'm not interested. I fell silent. Resigned, I turned my attention back to the travel brochures I had collected. One of them had a special feature titled Perfect for Solo Travel. Unlike in the past, there are now many travel plans tailored for solo travelers. I realized that instead of trying so hard to get Kevin to come along, maybe I could consider these options. If Kevin ever decides to join me, that would be great, but maybe it's time I start enjoying my retirement on my own. Ideally, it would be wonderful to travel with Heather and her family, but my teenage grandkids aren't interested in traveling with their grandma anymore. They're busy every day with school, extracurricular activities, and spending time with friends. They wouldn't want to use their precious free time for a family trip. It's a difficult age for them. Plus, it's not feasible to leave the grandkids at home and travel with Heather alone. So maybe a solo trip is the way to go. Once I've decided on something, it's best to act quickly. As I looked through the brochures, thinking about where to go. The loneliness of Kevin ignoring me faded, replaced by excitement. But as I was happily planning my trip alone, it was strange how Kevin started to take notice. What are you doing? He asked. I'm planning a trip. I replied, and he peeked at the brochure in my hand. Hey, this hotel looks nice. It even has a jacuzzi in the room. Right? Enjoying a jacuzzi all by myself would be such a luxury. I said, my face lighting up. To my surprise, he said. Sounds good. 
Maybe I'll join you. What, you're coming on the trip too? That's what I'm saying. I looked at him in disbelief, and he frowned. I quickly tried to smooth things over before he got upset. Yeah, let's go together. I said with a big smile. Wow, this is going to be fun. Just then, the doorbell rang. I saw a familiar face standing there. Oh, Elizabeth, come in. Elizabeth is Heather's best friend from college. She's been close to our family ever since she first stayed over at our house when she was 18. She's the same age as Heather, now 39. Married and a proud mother. Originally from another state, she moved nearby after getting married. Heather, on the other hand, moved to another state when she got married and doesn't come back often. Elizabeth visits us more frequently. She used to visit a lot during college, often staying over to work on assignments with Heather. We'd often have dinner together, and it felt like we had another Heather in the house. Hello. I brought you a little something from my recent trip. Wow, thank you. I thanked her and invited her in. Kevin appeared. Hey, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Kevin, usually so gruff and unfriendly, was always polite to Elizabeth. He's been that way for years, maybe he thinks of her like another daughter. Elizabeth is more polite to Kevin than to our own daughter Heather, probably because she's not family and wants to be polite. I remember Heather once said, Dad gets along better with Elizabeth than with me, and it annoys me. I laughed and asked if she was jealous. She pouted and said no. I guess daughters are always fond of their fathers. I chuckled at the memory, and Elizabeth gave me a curious look. Oops, I must look like a crazy old woman. I didn't want her to think that at 66 I was already losing my mind, so I said, I'll make some coffee and disappeared into the kitchen. Elizabeth, familiar with our home, sat on the living room sofa without a word. I started preparing coffee, glancing occasionally to see her comfortably seated. When I returned with the coffee and some snacks, I found a lively conversation going on. Really? Elizabeth laughed. Yes, it was hilarious. Kevin was laughing too. Heather might be right, I was feeling a bit jealous. Kevin always seemed so bored when talking to me, but he lights up around Elizabeth. Kevin seems happiest when he is with Elizabeth, rather than being with me or Heather. It's been like this for years. Long time. Elizabeth first visited our home when she was 18. They were shy at first, but got along well within a year. Since then, Kevin and Elizabeth have always been close, and I often see Kevin smiling when he's with her. I can't help feeling jealous of Heather's friend, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's like they're in their own world, making it hard to step into the living room. I found myself standing at the door, unable to move forward as their conversation grew quieter. Were they deliberately lowering their voices? Was it a secret conversation? I couldn't help but press my ear to the door to eavesdrop. Even though it was faint, I could hear their voices. A hot tub, huh? That sounds nice. I'd love to go. Should we go together then? Elizabeth must have said it casually, but Kevin's response surprised me. I was shocked, but it seemed like I was the only one. Elizabeth continued. That sounds great. We can share a room with a hot tub. Without a care. What are they saying? Even my husband and I don't share a hot tub. Yet, once again, I was the only one surprised. Kevin calmly. Ha ha ha. It's embarrassing to show this old body. Replied. What is he talking about? Unaware that I was gasping like a fish on the other side of the door, their conversation went on. If you say that, I've completely let myself go after having kids. Nonsense, Elizabeth, you're as beautiful as ever. 
remember that hotel we went to. Oh, stop it. You're making me blush. Okay. Well. I was speechless. I was like a fish gasping for air. But now I'm torn between diving into this raging current or swimming against it. In other words, should I burst into the room or not? I mean, come on, even I can see it. Kevin and Elizabeth are clearly involved. It's painfully obvious. And it seems like they've been involved for a long time. That miserable man, what should I do with him? I probably look like an evil witch right now. I wanted to scratch the door with my nails, but I barely held back. Wait, I need to stay calm. If I burst in and confront them now, they'll just cover it up. I need solid evidence first. Everything must come after that. To calm down, I drank all the coffee I had prepared. Now I'm full. Unaware that the wicked witch is filling herself with coffee, the unfaithful couple continued their surreal conversation. Have they forgotten I exist? Later that night, I saw Kevin watching a comedy show in the living room, so I called Heather from the bedroom. It's creepy watching him stare blankly at a comedy show. It's hard to imagine Dad laughing. But he was laughing a lot when he was alone with Elizabeth. Are you sure he was really laughing? You only heard it, right? Maybe his face was expressionless and only his voice was laughing. That's even creepier. We both laughed, ha ha ha. But this is no laughing matter. I still can't believe he's involved with Elizabeth. Unbelievable, right? Not just dad, but Elizabeth is married with kids. What are they thinking? It seems like it's been going on since college, so it started before they were married. Ugh, that's the worst. For Heather, knowing her friend and her father are involved must be nothing but disgusting. After she spat it out. What are you going to do? She asked me. Honestly, I want a divorce. That makes sense. But there's also the bond we've shared as a couple. That's a tough decision. I need to think about it for a bit. From my daughter Heather's perspective, she probably wanted to say, Why don't you just get a divorce? But she held back, understanding my feelings. She is such a kind daughter. Kevin and Elizabeth have trampled on not just my feelings, but also the gentle heart of Heather. As a father, as a friend. This is something that can never be forgiven. But even so, it's not something I can easily decide on. Divorce, I mean, as years of being together is not something to be dismissed so lightly. Marriage is a blend of good times and bad. Indeed, things have grown cold lately, but we've had our share of happiness. Especially before Elizabeth came into the picture, we were such a happy family. What should I do? Unable to find an answer, I hold my head in my hands. But events move forward, not giving me time to think. Wait, you're canceling the trip? Yeah, it just doesn't seem like it'll be fun going with you. What? The next day, Kevin, who usually eats breakfast in silence, suddenly spoke up to announce that he was canceling our trip. I felt both sadness and an inevitable sense of, of course, he would say that. I had a bad feeling ever since I overheard Elizabeth saying, I would love to go. So, I tried. Then I don't need this brochure anymore. As I was about to discard the hotel brochure, Kevin said, You don't need to throw it away. Snatched it away from me. Why not? If we're not going, it's just trash. We might go someday. Fine, then I'll just go by myself. So give it back. No. I might want to go someday, and until then, you can't go. What? I might feel like going too, and I won't allow you to go before me. What? I was bewildered by his unreasonable response. But at the same time, I wasn't surprised. Kevin planned to go with Elizabeth. 
He didn't want to risk running into me by chance. That's why he said I couldn't go. He's planning to go with Elizabeth. What a selfish person. Am I supposed to continue being married to this man? Though I wavered about reconciliation, those feelings quickly vanished. As expected, I found Kevin making reservations for the hotel on our home computer. Is he an idiot to use the same computer I use? He's too excited about this. I need to move towards divorce. As I was thinking that, things took another turn. One day, while considering which detective agency to hire for evidence collection, I came home from shopping to find a woman's luggage in the hallway. Recognizing it, I headed to the living room and, as expected, found Elizabeth there. Hello, Elizabeth. Elizabeth only nodded. At least say something. Hey you, I have something to talk to you about. Elizabeth remained silent while Kevin began speaking. Don't call me that way. What? Nothing. I had no reason to be addressed so informally by him, nor did I have time to listen to what he had to say. Suppressing my urge to respond harshly, I said, I'll make some coffee for us. I went to the kitchen to put some distance between us. I made their coffee as bitter as I could. So, what is it you want to talk about? After placing the cups of poisonous-looking coffee on the table, I sat on the couch facing them. Once I was seated, Kevin and Elizabeth exchanged glances and nodded. Then, they held hands. I had a bad feeling about their attitude, as if they were saying, we're so close. Kevin looked at me with a furrowed brow. I want a divorce. And said, Damn, he beat me to it. What? Nothing. When it comes to breaking up, it feels like whoever says it first has the upper hand. It's like saying, I don't like you, so let's break up, right? I wanted to say it first. I hate you so much. I'm dumping you. Being told first feels humiliating. Hey you, what is it with you, seriously? You're so restless. There it is, the hey you again. It really pisses me off. As I was getting annoyed, Kevin finally said it. I'm divorcing you to marry Elizabeth. Haha, <laughs> is that so, what? I was thinking how annoying it was and missed what he said. Or rather, did he just say something weird? Mary? Yes. With whom? With her, of course. Kevin raised the hand he was holding, Elizabeth's. So you're cheating? That's right. Yes, I got the proof. I never thought Kevin would confess to cheating. I'm cheating on you. Before I could gather evidence saved me the trouble of hiring a detective. Actually, when he said he had something to talk about, I had started the voice recorder app on my mobile phone. I recorded that statement perfectly. He can't deny it now. But the more evidence, the better. Let's get him to talk more. When did you two start? Oh, do you really want to know? Since college. I didn't ask you. But I wanted to praise myself for not responding. And what's with that drawn-out way of talking? Was Elizabeth always like this? Or does she change her personality in front of Kevin? Anyway, it's so irritating. Let's counteract with a drawl. Since college, so, before Elizabeth got married? Yes. You married your husband while having an affair with Kevin? You don't love your husband? Well, I have some affection for him. But I love my darling more. Can I punch her? Someone give me permission. What darling? I've never called Kevin that way. Even if he told me I could, I'd refuse. But your relationship isn't bad, right? So if you marry Kevin, Elizabeth, you will also divorce, right? That's right. How will you explain it to your husband? Just that I'm marrying the one I love. Is she an idiot? 
She must be an idiot. People who commit adultery aren't normal. So you're prepared to pay compensation to both me and Elizabeth's husband? What's compensation? My head hurts. Is she serious? Did she go to the same college as Heather? What has she learned since entering society? Nothing, apparently. Otherwise, she wouldn't have had an affair with a friend's father and continued it after marriage. Am I losing Kevin to someone like this? The shock is overwhelming and my head hurts. As I held my forehead, I heard the front door open suddenly. I looked up and there was my daughter, Heather. Hi there. You said you had something urgent to talk about. What's going on? In the living room, Kevin and Elizabeth are holding hands up high, and I'm here with my head in my hands, feeling burned out. Even if she asks me what's going on, how do I explain it other than saying it's a disaster? It's a total disaster. After thinking, I decided to be straightforward. Oh, a big showdown. So, Dad, you finally came clean. But why now? Kevin looked a bit surprised that his daughter knew about his affair. But seeing how I wasn't too shocked, he must have guessed it had been suspected for a while. Then he let out a deep sigh. I decided to get a divorce because... Yes, that's what I wanted to know. Why reveal it now after hiding it for 20 years and then suddenly decide to divorce? I couldn't help but lean forward, eager to hear the reason. Kevin looked at Heather, sitting beside me, then at me, and finally at Elizabeth. Because Elizabeth is pregnant with my child. What? There aren't a lot of moments in life when you are completely stunned. And now, I was definitely in one of those moments. Heather, beside me, was also stunned. Meanwhile, Kevin and Elizabeth were looking at us with bright, sparkling eyes. We had been using contraception, but it seems there was a failure. She's pregnant with my child. What? I shouted out loud. At 66, it was a full-throated scream. Are you out of your mind? I'm always in my right mind. Liar. You've been having an affair with a college student for 20 years, you're clearly not sane. Isn't this child just like your other children, not yours but her husband's? No way. My husband and I haven't been intimate for ages. It's only with my darling. Oh, how embarrassing. Elizabeth, shut up. Thank you, Heather. Heather's stern glare and low voice made Elizabeth shut up. If Heather hadn't said it, I would have. Shut up you brat that was close the room fell silent for a moment kevin spoke again after a while that's how it is we went to the hospital together to confirm the pregnancy you went together people must have thought he was her father i don't deny age gap marriages but coming from an affair it's something even a wife like me would view coldly Going to the hospital together despite that, even if you are retired and have time, Kevin, you are quite the bold one. Or maybe they are so out of touch with reality that they don't realize they aren't normal. I intend to pay alimony to both parties. So, Ashley, I am divorcing you. The absurdity of Elizabeth's behavior gave me another headache. Divorce is fine. I was planning on it too and with this blatant declaration, there is no point in clinging on. But there was one last question I needed to ask. Why did you cheat? That was what I wanted to know. We weren't madly in love, but we were managing fine, right? So why? As I spoke, I felt a sting in my nose. Don't cry, I told myself. Don't cry and give him the satisfaction of thinking I have any regrets. I don't have any, but it still hurts. I had thought we would spend many more years together as a couple. As I bit my lip to hold back the tears, I heard Kevin's voice. Of course, it's better to be with someone younger. Instantly, the tears vanished. What? 
younger is better, I get along better with younger women. With such a young and cute girl by my side, of course it would lead to this. What are you saying? Because she's young? Because you get along better with younger women? Are you seriously saying that? Everyone ages. Time doesn't stop, and everyone ages equally. Yet, you cheated for such a trivial reason? Elizabeth will age too. And besides, wouldn't Heather be happy too? Kevin, oblivious to my despair, looked at Heather with a goofy grin I had never seen before. What? What are you talking about? You're going to have a little brother or sister soon. Heather, didn't you say you wanted a sibling? It's late, but here you go, your own sibling. We don't know the gender yet, but isn't it exciting? He laughed heartily. Beside him, Elizabeth chuckled softly. My vision went dark. What kind of act is this? Who is this person? The man laughing and casually talking about something so absurd right in front of me. Oh, the Kevin I loved is gone. A tear I had managed to hold back slipped down my cheek from the shock. It was then. Ha, huh, ugh. I heard a strained voice from Heather next to me. Maybe she was in shock too and was crying. I quickly looked over at her, but what I saw was unexpected. Heather, what's wrong? Why are you laughing? That's right, Heather wasn't crying. Puff, ugh, ha, ha, ha. I can't take it anymore. She finally burst into laughter. As we stared in shock, Heather continued to laugh until tears streamed down her face. Heather? Don't you get it? That girl, Elizabeth. Heather wiped her tears and looked at Elizabeth. Elizabeth has always liked older men. She dated all sorts of older men, you know. What? Kevin was the one shocked by Heather's words. I was surprised too. Heather, stop saying weird things. But it's true, Elizabeth. You always asked friends to show pictures of their fathers. University professors are usually older, so you hit on them and got into trouble, didn't you? What are you talking about? Kevin was stunned by Elizabeth's past. One of those professors fell for Elizabeth's charms, they had a relationship. He got fired, and Elizabeth was suspended. What? I thought she took a break from school for family reasons. No, Dad, that was a complete lie. During her suspension, her parents were furious, and she dropped out. Now that I think about it, I had heard Elizabeth took a break for family reasons and then dropped out. So that was a lie. I never said the truth because we were friends, but now there's no reason to stay silent. It was strange how close she was to my dad. But to be betrayed by both my dad and my best friend. I hadn't noticed. Though Heather's face was smiling, as her parent, I could tell. She was truly angry. But, look! Maybe that was true in the past, but she's grown up now. Those things don't change easily, Dad. And I knew. Elizabeth still has relationships with older men. I've told her to stop many times since she's married, but she wouldn't, and I almost ended our friendship. Still! Elizabeth, are you seeing other men besides me? Kevin demanded, and Elizabeth faltered. I don't know what she's talking about, it's all Heather's nonsense. Who do you believe, me or Heather? Well, the fact that Kevin couldn't immediately respond to Heather showed his failure as a parent. Heather understood this too. I could feel Heather's gaze toward Kevin growing colder. Oh, by the way, look at this. Right after we found out about Dad's affair, I happened to see them at a department store and took this picture. Heather said, pulling out her mobile phone. There, in the jewelry section, was Elizabeth, laughing happily. Next to her was an elderly man we had never seen before. He seemed older than Kevin, possibly. Elizabeth, 
Who is this? Um, Dad? We had never met Elizabeth's parents, so we couldn't tell if it was true. But then Heather. Elizabeth, are you going to a hotel with your father? She showed us a picture of Elizabeth and the man entering a hotel. What the? Are you following us and taking pictures of us? Don't make it sound so bad. I'm not that free. I'm busy with work, housework, and raising kids. It was a coincidence, just a coincidence. You just happened to be in a hotel district. There's a cafe I frequent near that hotel. Liar! Coming from someone who was lying, that's rich! Elizabeth's face turned red with anger, while Heather's expression remained calm with a slight smile. Kevin's face, watching this, was pale. Kevin asked in a trembling voice, Hey, Elizabeth. What? The baby, is it really mine? What? Of course it is. But, if you think about it, the last time we were together was five months ago. How can you be in the early stages of pregnancy? You just don't understand pregnancy timelines because you're a man. No, no, that's definitely strange. Early pregnancy is usually about three months. If the last time was five months ago, anyone can see that's odd. Elizabeth is trying to push through because Kevin doesn't understand. Elizabeth, tell me the truth. How many men have you been with? Shut up. I never counted. What? Oh. What or O oh doesn't cover it? She had been talking smoothly but the story was falling apart. You never counted? How many are there? Heather laughed again. Kevin was stunned, Elizabeth looked angry, and I couldn't close my mouth in shock. The room fell silent, with only Heather's laughter echoing. Well, anyway. Snapping back to reality, I had to say something to Kevin. The divorce is decided. Make sure you pay the compensation. What? Kevin, also snapping back, looked surprised. Why is he so shocked? I'm giving you a divorce. Isn't that what you wanted? Oh, no. I mean... No, you can't back out now. Regardless of the child's paternity, your affair is clear. I'll get the compensation and we'll divorce. Wait! I still need you! How can you say that now? Apparently, Kevin realized Elizabeth's betrayal and thought he could reconcile with me. Life isn't that easy. You're going to leave me. I don't even know if the child is mine. And there's no way I'm staying married to someone who loves other men. Don't be ridiculous. What about the baby? Raise it as your current husband's child. That's impossible. I told you, we haven't been together. He'll find out. I don't care. Oh, the ugly fight has begun. This is the real battlefield. Heather said calmly from the side. Then, Oh, Dad. I'm cutting ties with you. She announced. What? I won't let my child, my grandchild see you ever again. No! That's too much! Why would I let someone who betrayed his family see them? It's bad for their upbringing. No! Kevin was always distant with his wife and children, but he was incredibly doting on his grandchildren. Not being able to see them is, in a way, a harsher punishment than divorce. Serves him right. Hey, what about me? I want to see my grandchildren! A chaotic scene unfolded for a while. Looks like it's going to be a long one, so I think I'll make another cup of coffee. After some time, Kevin and I got divorced. Heather's husband introduced me to a good lawyer, so the discussions went very smoothly. It's important to record things, after all. Kevin was found entirely at fault and had to pay alimony, and I got the house. 
Kevin moved to an old apartment with the little money and pension he had left. He will likely spend a lonely old age in that drafty room. I filed a claim against Elizabeth for damages, which led her husband to discover her infidelity. Moreover, multiple affairs and a pregnancy were revealed, and she was kicked out of the house. She certainly couldn't afford to pay damages to both her husband and me. Her parents, whom she ran crying to, paid on her behalf. Her husband also got child support in addition to the damages. Naturally, he got custody of the kids. They did a paternity test just to be sure, and the children were indeed his. She got help from her parents, but Elizabeth was always on bad terms with them. She had gotten expelled from college for her antics. Her parents were furious that she hadn't learned from her mistakes. They demanded that she repay the money they had covered no matter what. She was apparently quite distressed from their daily nagging. This was the information I got from Heather. Heather also told me. Dad keeps calling me, so I blocked his number. He's so persistent. I could only chuckle at Heather's words. The betrayal from a father she once adored must have been quite a blow. Love can turn into hatred in an instant. As for me, I sold the house filled with memories of Kevin and bought a condo for one. I'm spending my retirement there peacefully. I'm enjoying the solo trips I always dreamed of, trying new things, and attending hobby classes. Sometimes I travel with Heather's family. Well, it turns out living alone isn't so bad after all. I said with a smile, feeling content with my fulfilling days. I think Millie's been getting a bit cocky because I haven't been strict enough. She still complains about every little thing and throws fits when things don't go her way. I'm so tired of dealing with her. Yeah, I get that. Lately, because of what Elena said, Carlton and Bridget have been giving us a hard time. Maybe we should just put her in a care facility and be done with it. That sounds good to me. It's rare that we agree on parenting. I'll start looking for a residential care facility for her. Please do. I can't wait to be free from the hassle of taking care of an autistic child. I had just come back parents' home and overheard my parents having this unbelievable conversation. Hearing my parents call Millie and me troublesome kids made me furious. More than anything, I couldn't forgive them for calling Millie a hassle and planning to put her in a facility. Then I'll take care of her. I couldn't hold back any longer and burst into the living room, shouting at my parents. You were eavesdropping? Yes. I heard everything about the facility. I won't let you do that. And how do you plan to take care of her? You're still a college student. I'll figure out the money. I won't leave Millie with people like you. You! You think you can do it? Maybe it's for the best. She'll learn how hard it is to be with Millie and realize how powerless she is. She won't defy us anymore. So it's like tough love. I like it. Fine, take her. But you said you'd handle it. We're not helping at all. Once you realize how tough it is, you'll thank us. I slammed the living room door in frustration, seething at my parents' smug faces. They expected me to give up. Knowing that, there was no way I could ever send Millie back to them. For Millie, I was ready to face any hardship. But it was my parents who would regret it in 10 years. My name is Elena. I'm 19, and I've just started college. Leaving home for college, I didn't move out on my own. Now, I live with Millie. Millie is six years younger and still in middle school. Living together as a college student and a middle schooler, people sometimes mistake us for kids from a complicated family without parents. But that's not the case. Our parents are very much alive. However, with their major issues and Millie's minor ones, 
I decided to live with Millie. This toothbrush is the wrong color. Oh, sorry. The old one was worn out, so I got a new one. Is this color not okay? No. It has to be blue. Got it, wait here. I'll run to the grocery store. I stopped making breakfast and hurried to the local grocery store to get a blue toothbrush for Millie. You might wonder if this is necessary, but it is. If I don't get the blue toothbrush, Millie might have a meltdown. Millie has autism spectrum disorder and is very particular about certain things. So, her insistence on a blue toothbrush isn't just being fussy. It was my mistake to buy a different color because the store didn't have blue. I'm heading out. All right, have a good day. Millie waved cheerfully and headed off to school. It was a usual sight. Since my classes started from the second period today, I took my time with breakfast after seeing Millie off. Millie has autism, but she goes to school just like other kids. There is a support staff at school, so I feel at ease. At first, I was worried about living alone with Millie, but we've managed without any major issues and live peacefully. Every day was like a battle till I obtained the peaceful breakfast time like this. Millie wasn't the cause. The main issue was my parents. We discovered Millie's autism when she was a baby. You can wait quietly? You're such a good girl. Is she behaving again? Yes, even when I stop holding her, Millie doesn't cry at all. Elena cried a lot and was a handful, remember? Did I really cry that much? Mom and Dad doted on Millie. When parents focus too much on the younger child, the older one might feel neglected. But I was already in elementary school when Millie was born, six years apart. So, I quickly understood why they adored her so much. Besides, I was also charmed by Millie's cuteness. But my parents were concerned because Millie was too well behaved. She doesn't cry even with a dirty diaper. She can crawl now, but she doesn't move around much. Even when we hold her, she doesn't react. As a child, I found it strange that my parents were worried despite Millie being so good. After a while, my parents took Millie to the hospital, where they found out she had autism. At that time, Millie was just a baby who couldn't do much, so autism didn't change our daily life. My parents continued to adore Millie without doing anything differently. They told me about Millie's autism but as an elementary school kid, I didn't understand what it meant. However, problems started to arise when Millie entered preschool. What's Millie crying about? She got bitten by a mosquito at preschool today. She scratched it until it bled. She injured herself by scratching and can't stand the pain? This is really tough. She's been like this at preschool too. Other kids say she's noisy. She can't sit still during group activities and causes a scene, right? Exactly. Every day, the teachers tell me about Millie's troubles. The other day, she even hit a teacher who tried to discipline her. If this continues, they might ask her to leave. Wouldn't it be better to withdraw first? That might be true, but... While I was playing my game, my parents had a serious discussion at the table. They thought I was still a child and discussed complex issues in front of me. But children understand more than adults think. I grasped most of their conversation. And I thought, leaving because it's embarrassing? Not because she's bothering the teachers and other kids? It seems like Millie's autism had been communicated to the preschool. However, Millie rarely threw tantrums at home, so my parents thought it was just a stronger phase of defiance. But living in a group setting was too stressful, and Millie was causing more trouble at preschool than they had anticipated. It seems that at this rate, Millie won't be able to continue attending preschool. And that's not the only problem. If Millie can't go to preschool, 
Then does that mean I can't go back to work even though I just resumed working? Should I quit my job instead? You can't handle taking care of Millie. Stop saying things like that just to irritate me, okay? Stop talking to me like that. If I have to quit my job, I should be able to say what I want. Millie is our child, so it's not fair to blame me alone. I felt uncomfortable in the living room, so I stopped playing my game and escaped to my room. I think it was around this time that my parents' approach to Millie began to change. Some time passed, and I became a middle schooler, while Millie became an elementary school student. At school, Millie had a support aide who helped her. About once or twice a week, she would take classes tailored to her needs, separate from her classmates, allowing her to attend school like everyone else. My parents told me that when they were kids, everyone had to conform to the same values at school. But now, individuality is valued, and I believe that everyone is different. It seems that Millie's classmates share this understanding. Therefore, even though Millie has autism, her classmates just see her as Millie, and no major issues have arisen. Some kids might find her difficult to deal with and annoying at times. But that's not because of her autism, it's just that some people don't get along with each other. It's as simple as that, and there's no problem with her school life. In fact, she plays with her friends normally and doesn't suddenly make a scene or run off when she's with me. My impression of Millie now, compared to when she was in preschool, is completely different. However, my parents' perception of Millie seems to be very different from mine and those kids around us. Stop it! Let me out! When I came home from school, I heard Millie's voice coming from the storage room, and the door was rattling. There were two large boxes stacked in front of the door. Just by pushing them with my finger, I could tell they were very heavy. Millie! Hang on a second! I'll open it now! Wait! Don't open it without permission! As I tried to move the boxes, Mom appeared from the back, arms crossed, glaring at me. I felt a surge of fear towards my mother, but I couldn't back down now. Mom, did you do this? Why is Millie locked up? She's always so noisy. Complaining about snacks, refusing to do homework, and causing a fuss every time. So I put her in there. Millie isn't being selfish, is she? She just has clear preferences for snacks and always does her homework at night. She can be picky if she wants, but I don't like the noise. It's better for everyone if she's in there, away from the living room. I'll let her out when she tires herself out, so just wait a bit longer. There's no way I can wait for that. I ignored mom and tried to move the boxes. I couldn't budge them with my strength alone. When I checked inside, I found two water containers. They probably held around 20 liters each. Since there were two boxes, there were four containers in total, weighing about 176 pounds. No wonder I couldn't move them easily. But if I took them out one by one, I might manage. As I put all my effort into moving each container, Mom snorted and went back to the living room. Millie, are you okay? Yeah, Elena. When I opened the storage door, Millie was crying terribly. She had been locked up for some time and her voice was hoarse. I couldn't forgive Mom for doing this to Millie. That night, I explained the situation and asked Dad to scold Mom. However, Dad's response was chillingly indifferent. No wonder Mom is mad. Millie is actually noisy. But that doesn't justify locking her up, does it? Your upbringing is up to mom. If you have complaints, tell her directly, not me. I'm tired from work. Don't burden me with more problems at home. Dad brushed me off as if I were a stray dog. I knew he was indifferent to us, but I didn't think he'd remain so even when Millie was locked up. 
Mom also often gets angry at Dad's lack of involvement in childcare, leading to their frequent fights. If they're going to argue about childcare, I wish it were about something more substantial. Realizing I couldn't rely on Dad, I decided to handle Millie's situation myself. But since Mom wouldn't listen to me, all I could do was come home as early as possible to protect Millie. Even after that, Mom continued to lock Millie up occasionally, but knowing I would come to rescue her, Millie stopped making a fuss and waited quietly. Mom, noticing that Millie no longer caused a commotion, continued to lock her in the storage but stopped placing boxes in front of the door. Millie could leave any time but chose to stay quietly in the storage until I came home, so Mom decided the boxes were unnecessary. For Mom, the storage became a place to keep Millie quiet. As Millie learned to wait for me quietly, the incidence of her causing a fuss decreased. However, as Millie advanced in school, the situation changed slightly again. I told you I don't want this. Shut up. Clothes are clothes. Just wear it without complaining. I want to wear the green one today. That one's old and I threw it away. From the morning, Millie and Mom were arguing loudly. Mom had bought new clothes for school, but Millie didn't like them. When I looked at Dad, he stopped eating breakfast, looked annoyed, and stood up. I thought he would mediate, but he just left for work. I wished he could meet my expectations. Millie, do you want to wear mine? It's green and similar in style. Okay. I'll settle for that. When I showed Millie the green clothes from my room, she reluctantly agreed. It seemed any green clothes would do. Millie had strong preferences about colors and orders, and when she reached middle school, she started asserting these preferences verbally. She only liked blue toothbrushes and apparently chose her clothing colors based on the day of the week. She also insisted on doing her homework only after dinner and that she had to take her shower first. Millie would make a fuss whenever things didn't go exactly her way with these matters. It wasn't a big deal and we just needed to accommodate her, but Mom seemed to find it bothersome to cater to Millie's quirks, leading to more clashes between them. As a result, I'm home. Huh? Where's Millie? She was being loud again so I told her not to come back until dinner time and kicked her out. What? So where did Millie go? I don't know. You're kidding! I can't believe this! I rushed out of the house in a panic. A middle schooler should be able to go out and play on her own. But Millie has autism. There's no telling what could happen and where. Millie refuses to go anywhere except along her set route and paths she's walked before, so I decided to retrace the route Millie takes between home and school. Oh, thank goodness. You were here. I thought you'd come here, Elena. Millie was sitting quietly on a bench in the park located between our house and her school. She seemed to have predicted that I would retrace her school route. I took Millie's hand and we returned home together. When we got home, Dad was back from work. I know it's pointless to tell Mom, so I explained the situation to Dad. But I'm not expecting much from Dad either. I told you, I'm leaving you kids to Mom, didn't I? Don't come whining to me about every little thing. I'm not shocked since I wasn't expecting anything in the first place. That night, I woke up needing to use the bathroom. As I headed to the bathroom, I noticed the light was on in the living room and I could hear my parents' conversation from inside. Why do you dump everything about the kids on me? I'm tired from work. You quit your job so of course it's natural for you to look after the two of them, isn't it? What's natural about that? If you're going to act so high and mighty, why don't you earn enough so we don't need my dad's financial support? Aren't you ashamed that we've been relying on support ever since I quit my job? If you're going to say that, then why don't you go work part-time? 
You complained when you quit your job, didn't you? Millie's older now and goes to school so you can work now, can't you? What if something happens at school? I'm the one who has to deal with complaints from the teachers when I can't get there right away. As usual, my parents were fighting about us in the living room. Listening to their conversation makes me feel like I'm being treated as a burden and it doesn't feel good. But I overheard some useful information, so I'll try not to let it bother me. The next day, I called our grandparents Carlton and Bridget and asked them to scold my parents. Apparently, we've been receiving financial support from our grandparents ever since mom quit her job. In that case, my parents shouldn't be able to defy our grandparents. My plan seemed to work, and mom stopped locking Millie up or kicking her out. I feel like her clashes with Millie have decreased a bit too. Dad also stopped dumping everything on mom and started doing things when asked. But it's clear that they're both reluctantly doing it because our grandparents told them to. It shows in their expressions and attitudes. At this rate, I think there's a possibility they could revert back to how they were before. I resolved to take Millie away from this house once I started working. But it seems that was too late. When I became a college student, I started living on my own. The plan was to get used to living independently, then call Millie to join me once I got a job. I was worried about leaving Millie at home, but I thought our parents should be okay for a while after being scolded by our grandparents. However, I tried to go home as often as possible and asked our grandparents to check in on them from time to time. What a pathetic pair of parents, being monitored by both their own parents and their child. One day, I returned to my family home and decided to spend the night before heading back. That night, I woke up again needing to use the bathroom and overheard my parents' conversation in the living room once more. The contents of their discussion were unbelievable. Now that I've stopped scolding Millie, I think that girl is getting a bit carried away. She's still nagging about every little thing, and if I don't accommodate her, she'll start making a fuss. It's still such a hassle. I'm tired of raising this kid. True. Lately, we've been getting an earful from Carlton and Bridget because of what Elena said. Let's just put Millie in a facility and make our lives easier. That's a good idea. It's rare for you to have a same opinion on child-rearing matters. All right, I'll look into residential facilities for the disabled. Please do. Ah, uh, I'll finally be free from dealing with an autistic child. Anger welled up inside me upon realizing that my parents considered my sister and me to be burdens. Above all, I couldn't forgive them for calling Millie a hassle and trying to put her in some facility. Then I'll raise her. Unable to contain myself, I found that I had flung open the living room door and declared this to my parents before I knew it. You were listening? Yes, I heard everything, including the part about putting Millie in a facility. I won't let you do that. You say you'll raise her, but how do you plan to do that? You're still a college student, you know? I'll figure out the money somehow. I can't leave Millie with the likes of you. Listen, even if you say that. As Dad and I were talking, Mom tapped Dad's shoulder and joined the conversation. It's fine, isn't it? Once you experience the difficulties of being with that girl and realizes your own powerlessness, you won't be able to defy us anymore, right? You mean it'll be a good lesson for her, that might not be a bad idea. All right, got it. Take Millie with you. But remember, you said you'd take care of her yourself. We won't lift a finger to help. You'll appreciate us once you understand just how challenging it is. Irritated by my detestable parents' expressions, I slammed the living room door shut without another word. Starting the very next day, I immediately began preparations for Millie's move, and within two weeks, 
we started living together. It would be a lie to say I had no anxieties about a college student like myself living together with my autistic sister Millie. Even so, I couldn't leave Millie with those parents. I reaffirmed my determination to continue living with Millie in a way that would never let my parents have their way. However, once I started living with Millie, things went surprisingly smoothly. Millie is very well behaved. She shows particular preferences about things like the clothes she wears and the food she eats, but that's been the case since she lived at home. Come to think of it, I remember seeing her playing with friends when she was in elementary school. By the time she reached the upper grades, there were hardly any calls from the school about troubles. Even when mom locked her up at home, she quietly waited for me to return, and when she was kicked out, she predicted my actions and waited for me at the park. The only time Millie would make a fuss was when she was at home, mainly with mom. Finding this strange, I decided to look into autism a bit more thoroughly than I had before. That's when I realized something. This made sense. It's been a year since I started living with Millie. I'm off. Okay, have a good day. Millie waves energetically as she heads to school. It's the usual scene. My lectures start from the second period today, so after seeing Millie off, I leisurely enjoyed my breakfast. Freed from our parents, Millie's personality has become much brighter. Compared to when she lived at home, Millie seems like a different person. One time, Millie and I tried to predict what would become of our parents in the future. What do you think will happen to dad and mom, based on your predictions, Elena? Mom complained when she quit her job, but now she's not even working part-time, right? Since the support from grandparents stopped after we left home. I guess they'll have a tough time in their old age without any savings. I think it'll be even more miserable for them. Why? Because I've observed our parents more closely than you, Elena, so I understand them well. It seems Millie believes our parents will face an even more terrible future than I anticipate. I thought Millie's own wishes might be mixed in with her prediction, but she ended up winning this guessing game. Ten years later. I was 29, and Millie was 23. We've moved since then, but I still live together with Millie. One Sunday, while Millie and I were relaxing at home, we suddenly heard a loud knocking at the front door. The person was pounding on the door instead of ringing the doorbell, so Millie and I both felt terrified and trembled together. However, upon hearing the voice coming from the entrance, our fear vanished in an instant. Elena! Millie! You live here, don't you? My mom told me. Open up, please. Millie and I let out a sigh filled with both relief and exasperation, then headed to the front door together. Making such a commotion would disturb the neighbors, so we decided to at least let mom into the entryway for now. This was probably just as mom intended. She likely thought that simply ringing the doorbell would get her turned away. Ah, Elena, Millie, it's been a while. Look how splendid you've become. When we opened the door, Mom tried to barge right into the house, so Millie and I blocked her with our arms outstretched. Hey, what do you think you're doing, trying to enter without permission? Huh? It's fine, isn't it? If you want to talk, we'll hear you out here for now. Is that so? Mom took a step back and took a deep breath with her hand on her chest. She seemed somewhat nervous. Then she apologized to us with great vigor. I'm truly sorry. I was out of my mind ten years ago. I think I was especially horrible to Millie. Millie and I exchanged glances. It's not that we were confused by Mom's sudden visit to apologize. We knew that Mom's apology was an insincere lie and that apologizing wasn't her real reason for coming. Let me say this first, we won't live together with you. Huh? How did you know what I was going to say? 
we can pretty much guess. We've heard from Grandpa and Grandma about what you've been up to. Realizing that we had seen through her true intentions, Mom made a rather awkward expression. Our parents divorced three years after Millie and I started living together. We had witnessed them being on bad terms many times. With us gone, leaving just the two of them, their unlikable qualities probably became even more pronounced. That's why we predicted that the day our parents would divorce wasn't far off. Since we had anticipated it, we weren't surprised when we heard about their divorce, and frankly, we couldn't care less when it came to our parents. You've been living alone since the divorce, right? Once people get a taste of an easy life without working, it's hard to break out of it. But Grandma said that Mom has always had a personality that goes with the flow and takes the easy path ever since you were a child. So maybe that's why you found it bothersome to accommodate Millie and clashed with her so often. Mom didn't work even after the divorce. She apparently thought a life without working was comfortable. The fact that she could live for seven years without working after the divorce was thanks in part to the division of assets at the time of divorce, but that's not the whole story. Still, I can't believe Dad had an affair. And apparently the woman was ten years younger than him. Dad was unexpectedly shrewd. The cause of our parents' divorce was Dad's infidelity. As a result, Mom got consolation money for the affair, pushed unfavorable conditions onto Dad, received a larger portion of the couple's savings, and lived off that money for the past seven years. However, if you don't work, the money will only keep decreasing. You've come to us because you've run out of money, right? You asked our grandparents for help first, but they turned you away, didn't they? We heard about that too. There's no way Grandma and the others would help Mom after you tried to abandon Millie. Mom must be around 58 years old now, right? You quit your job before turning 30? Even if you say you want to work now, you'll face many challenges at your age. And with your lack of motivation, you probably don't even feel like working anyway. Well, even if you start saving money now, a difficult retirement is pretty much guaranteed. Mom fell silent from the beginning of this conversation, staring at us with a puzzled look in her eyes. It's not because we're voicing Mom's own thoughts. Are you really, Millie? Yeah, why? What about your autism? I have autism, so what? What do you mean? How are you so put together? Don't you depend on Elena to get by? That's rude. I know I caused some trouble for Elena, but I don't think I completely depend on her. I have a job too, you know. I heard from my mom that you have a job. But isn't it just some simple tasks through disabled employment? Mom, that's enough of belittling Millie. Millie disclosed her autism to the company and is working admirably as a programmer in a regular position. Millie is a programmer. Mom's eyes widened to twice their size and her mouth hung open, astonished by the difference between Millie now and ten years ago. Huh? I couldn't help but laugh at Mom's odd expression. What's with that face, Mom? Millie has high-functioning autism. High-functioning autism? Autism is often accompanied by intellectual disabilities. However, about 20% have mild intellectual disabilities and higher intellectual functioning. This is called high-functioning autism. Millie has autism spectrum disorder which used to also be referred to as Asperger's syndrome or pervasive developmental disorder. But now, the terminology has been unified under autism spectrum disorder, including high-functioning autism. Mom had lumped it all together as autism, but looking closely, there are several types of autism. Millie has autism, but with mild intellectual impairment. That's why she could play normally with friends, and was quiet when we first started living together. But didn't she constantly have problems in preschool? That was simply because she was still immature mentally. Wasn't she always making a fuss at home? 
That's because you ignored Millie's fixations and tried to force her to listen. Apparently Millie experiences more stress than others when she can't do what she has in mind. But it's not a big deal if you just pay attention to that stress. The things she has in mind are mostly trivial, like brushing teeth, clothing colors, the order and timing of using the bathroom. So in Millie's case, she's able to work. Still, to be a programmer. Millie develops strong fixations on certain things. When she took a light programming class in high school, it captured her interest. She started studying on her own outside of school. After graduating high school, she got a job at her current company and is apparently one of their top performers. So Millie is a programmer and Elena is a nurse? Meaning you both have decent incomes? It's not a lot, but we get by. Then you should provide some support. You need to repay me for raising you. Mom straightforwardly demanded money. However, she seemed flustered. As if backed into a corner with no concern for appearances. Such brazen people are troublesome. Locking me up and kicking me out of the house was abuse. Since I didn't report it, let's call it even. As I was warily facing off against the unabashed mom, Millie swiftly rejected her words and chased her out. After closing the front door, Millie gave me a thumbs up. Getting rid of mom made us feel a bit relieved. Three months after mom's visit, dad showed up. Ah, Elena, Millie. Look how great you've grown up. I'm so sorry about 10 years ago. I wasn't in my right mind then. I know I treated Millie especially horribly. I felt like I was watching a rerun. Dad came to apologize, but we knew his motive was the same as Mom's. We're not going to living together. We heard the stories from grandparents. Before coming here, you went to Grandma for help and got turned away. You married your mistress who was 10 years younger, but got divorced because of her reckless spending, right? And apparently, she was a parasite who dated and married men, blew through their money, then dumped them when it ran out. So she used up all your money and left you. Dad, you're 61 this year, right? Being left with nothing in your 60s must be rough. You were thrilled thinking she was 10 years younger than mom, but too bad. Though you must have known she was divorced with a kid. Maybe you should have been more cautious instead of jumping in. Are you really Millie? I don't want to explain, so just ask mom. I got irritated with dad saying the same things as mom. And the rest unfolding the same way as with mom irked me even more. You too, pay back the debt of gratitude for raising you. Didn't you and mom receive support from grandma and grandpa? And the reason we could go to college and live together while I was a student was thanks to the money they provided. We don't owe you anything, and we already paid back the living expenses and tuition grandma and grandpa covered by working. Now we're trying to figure out how to repay the favors we still owe them. Millie and I kicked Dad out of the house together. Closing the front door, we both felt refreshed. You were right, Millie. Seems like they won't just have a poor retirement, but much worse. I only thought they would get divorced and cut off by us and the relatives. I never imagined they'd run out of money and hit retirement at 60 either. We laughed together at the entrance over failing to predict our parents' futures. After that, mom seemed to give up on relying on us, not contacting or coming by anymore. However, dad didn't give up, coming to our place many times. Even when ignored at home, he started loitering around and ambushing us outside. I had no choice but to report a suspicious person hanging around and causing trouble. Dad is a weirdo, so I don't think that's inaccurate. With a man stalking two women, the police took swift action. The police must have warned Dad, as he finally gave up on us. 
The fact that our parents tried to abandon Millie is well known among relatives through me and our grandparents, so no one will likely help them. And since the reason for their divorce was an affair, they probably won't reconcile either. They'll struggle without money, but from now on they can each slowly live out their retirement years alone. Some time later, Millie and I started living separately. Millie was getting married. An office romance, and he apparently understands her condition. I'm a bit frustrated Millie beat me to it, but I'll congratulate her to maintain my dignity as the older sister. Did Abigail and Olivia's luggage arrive? From today, we're taking them in. Thomas, my husband, declared triumphantly over the phone. I was speechless at Thomas's sudden declaration. It seemed like Thomas had only his sister Abigail and her concerns in mind. There wasn't a trace of consideration for me. I thought I might as well leave such a husband. Yeah, the luggage arrived, and I've just moved into my new place too. I responded in a deliberately cheerful tone. A new place? Thomas was taken aback by my murmur. My name is Harper. I just turned 50 this year. I work in sales at a major company. My job involves dealing with customer complaints and issues, but it's also very rewarding and fun. I have many clients who have been good to me over the years. After working hard during the week, I tend to relax at home on the weekends. My family consists only of my husband, Thomas. We don't have children. My parents passed away early. We live near the in-laws but aren't very close. It's a relationship of keeping a respectful distance. Thomas loves dining out and often takes his sister Abigail with him to restaurants. Abigail's daughter, Olivia, also joins them. I used to complain to Thomas about this at the beginning of our marriage. Because he always seemed to prioritize Abigail and her family over me. However, those feelings gradually faded. Because, I came to understand Thomas's sincere feelings. I want to repay them for the hard times during our student days. I came to understand Thomas's sincere feelings. In fact, the in-law's house is poor. They lived in a small, old apartment that was very cramped. Ever since my father-in-law failed in his business venture, that's how they've been living. Even so, Thomas worked hard in his studies. But he didn't get into his first choice national university. It seems he only got into a private university. Naturally, the in-laws said they couldn't afford to pay for it. That's when Abigail, who was already working, helped out a bit with the tuition. With the help of scholarships, Thomas somehow managed to graduate. So, Thomas is grateful to Abigail for supporting him through tough times. And after getting married, Abigail quit her job. Her husband wanted her to be a housewife. So, the amount of money Abigail could use was limited. After I heard that story, I stopped complaining. I could understand the reason for wanting to give back. I thought I should let Thomas do as he pleases. It's a bit lonely, but it can't be helped. So, I'm going out to eat with Abigail and the others now. Thomas is going out to dine with Abigail and the others today as well. Have a good time! I sent Thomas off with a smile. I thought we would continue to live supporting each other, with Thomas valuing his family. That's what I believed. But our relationship hit a snag three months ago. One day, Thomas came to me with a serious look and said, Actually, Abigail is getting a divorce. It seems she's decided to keep custody of Olivia. Hearing about Abigail's divorce, I was honestly quite troubled. Because Abigail is the type of person I find difficult to deal with. This goes back to when I went to greet the in-law's house to marry Thomas. Abigail happened to be visiting the in-law's house at the time. Thomas, you're marrying someone like this? She's so plain and has terrible taste. 
Abigail laughed the moment she saw my face. Thomas and the in-laws didn't say anything. Everyone ignored it. So, I had no choice but to tolerate Abigail's rude behavior. As I remembered these things, Thomas continued. I'll be going to my parents' house every day for a while to check on them. Abigail is delicate, unlike you, who are thick-skinned. And I'm worried about Olivia too. Thomas casually insulted me. But I didn't argue back. I didn't want to fight with Thomas and have him spend even more time at his parents' house. Take care. I couldn't say anything else and just saw Thomas off. After that, Thomas started to be away from home more often. He used to come home around 8 p.m. on weekdays. But now, sometimes he doesn't come home until the morning. He's hardly ever at home on weekends. My loneliness just kept growing. I'm home. When I returned from work and called out, there was no response. The room was pitch dark. Maybe he's at his parents' house again. I became more depressed with Thomas's absence. But when Thomas was home, he started to cause me more trouble. That day. Thomas was unusually at home but made an unreasonable request of me. I heard from Abigail that you haven't given a housewarming gift yet? That's mean. You're about to get your bonus, right? Why don't you buy her a brand name bag or something? Thomas said it as if it were a matter of course. Why do I have to give a housewarming gift? Shouldn't you be the one to do it, Thomas? I responded. But Thomas immediately got angry. You married me, so you're part of Abigail's family, aren't you? Don't you think it's unreasonable not to even be able to give a family member a gift? Thomas berated me with those words. Thomas's lecture went on for about an hour after that. In the end, he said, Anyway, make sure you give a present to Abigail and Olivia, all right? and then he left the house. He was probably heading to his parents' house. I've never received anything from Abigail. I murmured softly. Later, I got a call from Abigail. Hello? You heard from Thomas, right? You really don't get it. Normally, you give a housewarming gift. Abigail said it as if it were the most natural thing in the world. I was irritated by her selfishness. So, I countered. But you've never done anything for us, have you? Even at our wedding, we didn't receive any congratulatory money from you. At the wedding, Abigail said with a smile, handing over an empty envelope. We're family, so we don't need congratulatory money, right? Abigail said with a smile, handing over an empty envelope. But this is empty, isn't it? Even when I asked, Abigail remained unfazed. I did buy the envelope, though. Aren't I kind? Abigail said confidently. I was speechless at her incredible lack of common sense. And Abigail had no restraint. She ate a lot of the banquet food and drank several rounds of drinks not included in the course. When I handed her the catalog gift for the wedding favors, aren't there any no-shows? If there were, I could take home several. Harper, you really don't think things through. She even complained about that. As I remembered these things, Abigail laughed and responded. You're my brother's wife. I don't need to give you anything. You're the lowest in our family hierarchy. You should be honoring me, instead. Now go buy me the latest brand name bag. I was dumbfounded by Abigail's audacity. While I remained silent, Olivia started talking to me. Harper, make sure you buy my bag too. I won't forgive you if it's not a limited edition. By then. Olivia hung up the phone, laughing. This is unbelievable. Why am I the only one subjected to this treatment? I let out a deep sigh. After that, Thomas started to come home even less. When he did come home, 
he would take money from my wallet. Stop it! Even as I desperately tried to stop him, Thomas didn't care. You're always at home, so she doesn't use money, right? I'll put it to good use. Be grateful. Holding a few bills in his hand, Thomas left the house. I can't take it anymore. I was worn down by Thomas's selfish actions. Then, one day, the doorbell rang and I opened the front door. Yes. A man who seemed to be a mover said, Is this Thomas's house? We'll start bringing in the boxes right away. He began bringing in a large number of cardboard boxes into the house. I hurried to stop him. Wait a minute. We didn't order this. I informed him. But the mover looked a bit troubled and answered. This is Thomas's house, right? The request came from Thomas himself. I was confused by the mover's reply. What were all these cardboard boxes for? Feeling an indescribable anxiety, I immediately called Thomas. What is it? Fortunately, Thomas picked up right away. In the background, I could hear the crude laughter of Abigail and Olivia. I immediately questioned Thomas. Right now, movers are bringing cardboard boxes into our house one after another. What's going on? Then, Thomas said something unexpected. Ah. Uh, did Abigail and Olivia's stuff arrive? From today, we're taking them in. I don't need your opinion on this. Thomas declared this triumphantly over the phone. In the background, Abigail chimed in. Looking forward to living with you. You don't have kids, so you must be happy to take care of our Olivia, right? You should be grateful. This old lady as a substitute parent? I'm too embarrassed to even tell my friends. Olivia sounded somewhat indignant. I was speechless at Thomas's sudden declaration. Probably the in-law's house was too cramped, and Abigail must have pleaded with him. Our house is larger and has spare rooms. They must have known this and asked to stay. It seemed Thomas only had Abigail and her concerns in mind. There wasn't a trace of consideration for me. I thought I might as well leave such a husband. I was determined. As I remained silent, Thomas continued to give orders. More stuff will arrive in a week. We bought new furniture for Abigail and her daughter from an online shop. So, make sure everything is arranged properly. We'll stay at my parents' house until then. We can't live in a room scattered with cardboard boxes. Thomas said this, laughing. Isn't this too pitiful for Harper? She has to organize our stuff all by herself. Abigail was also laughing. Take good care of our precious belongings, okay? Olivia said this arrogantly. I wanted to end this phone call quickly. So, okay. So, I said just that and immediately hung up. Right after hanging up. All right, let's do this. I sprang into action immediately. One week later, Thomas called again. Did the additional stuff arrive? Is the room all organized? Thomas must have been curious about the current state of the house. He seemed somewhat unsettled. So, I smiled brightly. Yes, the stuff arrived, and I've just moved into my new place too. I deliberately responded in a cheerful tone. A new place? Thomas was taken aback by my response. In fact, on the day Abigail's stuff first arrived, I immediately started to take action. I went straight to the local real estate agent and demanded, Please find me a place I can move into right away. Direct discussion. At first, I was turned down. Most properties require some refurbishment before moving in, and immediate occupancy isn't usually possible. However, after checking with several real estate agents, one introduced me to a property. It was a women-only share house. Equipped with an auto-lock system, 
it was secure and reassuring for a woman to live in. The bathroom, toilet, and kitchen were shared spaces, so electricity and gas were already set up. This meant I could use them from the first day of moving in. A cleaning company regularly cleaned the place, so it was always clean. Additionally, the furniture was provided, so minimal personal belongings were no problem. According to the real estate agent, there was one room available. I'd like to see the room right away. I immediately asked the real estate agent. He took me to view the place right then. Then I took a look inside the room. I'll take this one. I made an immediate decision. Thomas was noticeably shaken by this news, even over the phone. You can't just move out on your own, can you? We're married. Apologize to me right now and come back home. Thomas berated me. Abigail, seemingly agitated, asked. What's going to happen to our room? She sounded somewhat hysterical. Olivia, too. Don't mess with me, old lady. Yelling and getting angry. As I remained silent, Thomas, as if he had an epiphany, said. Do you think you can just do as you please? You'd be in trouble if we got divorced, you know? Exactly. With your age and looks, you won't get married again, right? Poor, plain Harper. You'll have an unstable future. Serves you right. Abigail spoke as if she was pleased. In the background. The old lady is finished. She laughed. Then, Thomas said triumphantly. If you apologize sincerely to us now, we might forgive you. We're kind, unlike you. They mocked me. In the background, Abigail and the others were shouting in agreement. So, I retorted. The one who should be apologizing is you, Thomas. I know about the affair. Thomas was clearly flustered. In fact, Thomas had been having an affair for over three months. The other woman was a female colleague from his workplace. How did you find out? I thought it was absolutely secret. Thomas asked tentatively, as if fearful. He was convinced it would never be discovered. So, it's no wonder Thomas reacted that way. Being kind, I decided to enlighten him. I hired a detective, just in case. You were hardly ever home, right? I thought maybe you were cheating. Lucky me, my hunch was right. I continued while Thomas remained silent. I was surprised when I hired the detective. It seems the investigation was wrapped up in just three days. You were meeting your mistress every day, weren't you? It looks like dining out with Abigail and the others was only on your days off. The detective said there were plenty of photos. I said this, laughing. According to the detective, Thomas was gallivanting around with his mistress every day after work. The money he had been taking from my wallet was likely used for his mistress. Thomas and his mistress were always close together, making it easy for the detective to take photos. I'll be divorcing you and seeking compensation. From your mistress too, of course. I'll be sending a formal notice to your workplace, so look forward to it. I told Thomas, laughing. After receiving the detective's report, I immediately went to a law firm. Having concrete evidence, even the law firm was surprised. You! Thomas's voice was clearly irritated. Sending a formal notice to the company would make the contents quite predictable, even if not read. Not only to Thomas, but also to the mistress working at the same company. The affair would likely become known to their colleagues. Hey, Thomas, are you okay? The situation was turning grim, and Abigail sounded anxious. She must have planned to live a comfortable life, relying on Thomas and me to take care of everything. Abigail had been a housewife for a long time and probably couldn't work now. Thomas was her only reliance, understandably. What are we going to do, Thomas? 
I haven't worked a single day since graduating high school, and there's no way I can start a part-time job now. Olivia seemed somewhat troubled. Thomas, being scolded by Abigail and Olivia, couldn't say anything. I decided to twist the knife further. Thomas probably hasn't saved any money, right? The investigation report said you've been splurging on your mistress. Buying her the latest brand name bags. Do you have debts, perhaps? I dropped this bombshell. Thomas was so flustered he couldn't find the words. Ignoring Thomas, Abigail shouted at him. What? You never buy anything for me, but you buy things for your mistress? This is ridiculous. And now debt? How much do you owe? I hate Thomas so much. He never bought me anything despite all my pleading. Olivia also scolded Thomas in a shrill voice. Abigail and Olivia were making a commotion on the other end of the phone. Harper, I'm truly sorry. Please, do something about these two. Thomas pleaded with me in an exhausted voice. But I had no intention of forgiving Thomas at all. Why don't you handle it yourself? I'm not involved, and it's your responsibility. You better tell your mistress quickly, or the formal notice will reach your company soon. I said to Thomas with a sarcastic smile. Damn! Thomas sounded frustrated. Ignoring him, I continued. Good luck then. And make sure to pay a hefty compensation. I then hung up the phone. Thomas tried to call me several times after I hung up, but I ignored all his calls. Let Thomas and Abigail struggle all they want. I murmured softly and set Thomas's contact to block. Afterward, my divorce from Thomas was finalized. At first, Thomas resisted. He had been able to live comfortably with both our incomes. But he couldn't maintain the same lifestyle on his income alone. He knew this and didn't want to divorce. However, I had conclusive evidence of Thomas's affair. Ultimately, I made it clear that I had no intention of reconciling and would sue if he didn't agree to the divorce. So Thomas hung his head. I agree to the divorce. And signed the divorce application. Thomas and his cheating partner are then asked for compensation. I decided on the amount after getting information from my lawyer about the market price. So, I believe the amount was fair. In fact, the mistress paid immediately. She explained the situation to her parents and borrowed the money. However, for Thomas, the amount was burdensome. Can't we reduce the amount? He asked several times, but ultimately, I refused all of Thomas's requests. During a meeting at the law firm with Thomas. Should I add on the amount you took from my wallet too? I asked with a smile, and Thomas turned pale. That amount is fine. In the end, Thomas agreed, trembling. Afterward, Thomas and his mistress resigned from their company. The affair became known internally, likely due to the formal notices sent. After all, it seems that people around them became aware of the relationship between the two when they sent the proof of contents. Even if you don't know what's inside the envelope, it's an envelope from a lawyer's office. You can probably guess what's inside. In the end, Thomas became uncomfortable and resigned. Maybe he couldn't stand the funny rumors being spread about him within the company. After leaving the company, Thomas worked in day labor through a temp agency. Given his age, it seemed difficult for him to find a new job immediately. But they won't wait for payment. There are living expenses and he may have to pay compensation in installments. Moreover, there was still a mortgage to pay off. And debts likely incurred for his mistress also came to light. Life must be quite tough for him. Occasionally, I receive messages from Thomas through the lawyer. I was wrong. Please, let's get back together. I'm begging you. Life is so hard, 
I'm barely making it. If only I had been kinder to you, Harper. Thomas reportedly cried as he spoke to the lawyer. He seems to be in a dire situation, but it's too late for regrets now. And the situation for Abigail and Olivia is also grim. Abigail and Olivia are currently living with Thomas. However, due to Thomas's lack of funds, their living situation is dire. One day, I received a call from Abigail on my cell phone. I had blocked Thomas's number, but not Abigail's, which turned out to be a mistake. Apparently that backfired. I wondered what the call was now, so I answered the phone. Hello? As soon as I picked up, Abigail pleaded with me. Please, I'm begging you to help us. I'm living with Thomas, but he has no money. Our electricity and gas are going to be cut off, and we have nothing left to eat. Abigail sounded exhausted. I was surprised to hear they were in such dire straits. But I had no intention of helping. So, I coldly rejected her plea. Why don't you just get a job? You're healthy, Abigail, and you used to work before, right? Then, presumably Olivia, who must have been next to Abigail, spoke up. Aren't you being too harsh, Harper? You work at a big company, and you took a lot of money from Thomas and his mistress, so you must have some financial leeway, right? Therefore, you have a duty to take care of mom and me. Just tell us your address, and we'll come to you for you to take care of us. It seemed Olivia still had no intention of working, even now. It was truly appalling, given her youth. Holding back a sigh, I made it clear to her. Now that I'm divorced from Thomas, you and your mother are complete strangers to me. I have no intention of supporting you, and I want nothing to do with you from now on. Don't ever call me again. As soon as I finished speaking, Olivia shouted. Don't mess with us, old lady. You just shut up and take care of us. Give us your address right now. Abigail and Olivia continued to scream even after that. Their characters are likely never going to change. I have nothing to do with this anymore. Goodbye. With that, I hung up. And immediately blocked Abigail's number on my phone. I wanted nothing more to do with them. Given their current trajectory, Abigail and Olivia's situation will likely worsen. But it's a result of their own negligence. I think they deserve to continue suffering. A year later. I decided to leave the share house. It was a bit sad to leave because I had made friends there. The reason for leaving the enjoyable share house was that I decided to get a dog. I encountered the dog at an adoption event, which I attended on a whim, invited by a friend who loves dogs. That's where I had a fateful encounter. While other dogs were being friendly with various people, this one was different. It just kept staring at me. The moment our eyes met. I felt that this dog needed me. I attended the adoption event several times afterward, deepening my bond with the dog. After several visits, I was joyfully allowed to adopt it. However, pets were not allowed in the share house. So regrettably, I had to leave. Now, I live in a pet-friendly apartment. Dogs don't betray and they're incredibly adorable. Come here. The dog runs towards me happily when I call. There may be various difficulties ahead, but I'm not alone anymore. I want to move forward, supporting each other with this beloved dog. Get to cleaning the house already. Slaves don't get to rest. That's what my husband Anthony said as he splashed beer on me. I was so taken aback by the suddenness of it all that I froze. My body was wet, and the distinctive smell of beer filled my nostrils. As I stood there in disbelief, Anthony hurled more abuse my way. What should I do? What does Anthony want from me? 
Just when I felt cornered and at a loss for words, I heard a voice from the computer. The moment he heard that voice, Anthony, who had been red-faced and angry just seconds before, stiffened and collapsed on the spot. My name is Chloe. I'm 33 years old. I work as an office clerk at a company in a certain region, putting my all into my job every day. My days consist of dealing with large amounts of data and documents and punching numbers into a calculator. I think to myself that the company should make more use of computers, but being one of the younger employees within the company, I didn't have much say. I worked while being mindful of my superiors and was forced to attend drinking parties I didn't want to go to. My spirit was utterly exhausted. These numbers are wrong again. I'm sorry. Please, I'm really counting on you. You've been making a lot of mistakes lately. Yes, sir. The mistakes kept piling up due to my fatigue, further diminishing the little confidence in my work I had to begin with. I wondered if quitting would be better for me. It was during these times that a certain man started coming to the company as a salesperson. This man was the person who would later become my husband, Anthony. From just one look, it was clear that Anthony was a kind man. Even to me, who only did things like making coffee, Anthony was always kind. I found myself drawn to Anthony before I knew it. However, I couldn't bring myself to express my feelings to Anthony. It was all one-sided on my part, and I was sure Anthony didn't think anything of me. That thought was always in my mind. But a few months after Anthony started coming to the company, to my surprise, he approached me. We started going out for drinks after work, which led to us dating. After two years of dating, we were able to get married. With our marriage, I quit my job, and Anthony and I started a new life in a new home. We picked out a place we both liked after visiting various real estate agents, quitting my job and thinking about the happy life ahead with Anthony. Made my heart lighten. However, the life I had envisioned was not to be. A month into our marriage, I noticed Anthony was acting differently. Welcome home, Anthony. You're early today. Yeah, well. He didn't look at me and didn't even greet me back properly. Seeing Anthony so different from usual genuinely worried me. After that, Anthony seemed somewhat listless. Are you okay? You seem tired. Huh? Oh. He seemed more irritable than tired. Indeed, he was different from his usual self. I thought maybe he was just tired today and didn't think much of it. However, the next day and the day after that, Anthony's attitude remained unchanged. Gradually, it wasn't just his attitude and greetings, he stopped taking the sandwiches I made for him and didn't contact me when he was coming home late. I could tell that he was starting to treat me carelessly. Maybe I had done something to offend Anthony. As I pondered over this, my own time flew by. I was filled with insecurities about my behavior and thoughts of Anthony. Things changed a few months after Anthony started showing a change in his attitude. He began to verbally abuse me out of nowhere. One evening, Anthony spoke to me without touching his dinner. Hey, Chloe. Do you realize? Realize what? Without a subject, his sudden question was impossible to understand. I urged Anthony to explain further. Without any sign of remorse, Anthony said. Your cooking is terrible. What? Terrible? Yeah. I guessed you hadn't noticed. Think about how I feel, having to eat such terrible food every day. I had often cooked meals during our dating period, but he had never made such a complaint before. He always seemed to enjoy the meals, and he had told me many times they were delicious. Watching him like this, I never thought Anthony would find the meals I made unpalatable. You used to say it was delicious. What? Did I? 
Seeing my anxious face, Anthony started laughing loudly. Then, after a good laugh, Anthony put down his fork and went back to the bedroom. Looking at the untouched meal, I felt indescribable. I too put down my fork and kept replaying Anthony's words in my mind. Had he been hiding that he found the meals unpleasant all this time? Or had my cooking skills just declined? I thought about it a lot but couldn't come to a satisfying conclusion. However, one thought did seem to make sense. His recent behavior, his words just now. I thought maybe Anthony had come to dislike me. At first, I thought maybe he was just a little tired, but his recent behavior has definitely been too much. The Anthony I knew would have told me if he was tired. It must be so. But that would mean I did something to make him dislike me. However, I can't think of anything that might have caused it. My doubts about Anthony only grew. Then, another two months passed. Day by day, Anthony's attitude worsened, and the Anthony I knew during our dating days seemed to have disappeared completely. He verbally abused me daily and made a point to show his irritation by making noise. Do you even know how to clean properly? Clean? Yeah. You haven't done the bathroom or the toilet, and the living room is filthy too. I always tried to keep the house clean, doing the bathroom and toilet cleaning daily. I even vacuumed every day. What else does Anthony want me to do? I. While I was feeling down, Anthony didn't stop hurling insults. What hurt me the most was him saying, Why did I even marry a woman like you? Was all the love he professed just a lie? The moment I thought that, I felt tears streaming down my cheeks. Ugh, why are you crying? Cut it out with the fake tears. In the past, if I cried, he would comfort me. Now, he only says cruel things. Anthony went back to the bedroom, mocking me. Initially, we shared the same bedroom, but now I've been pushed out. I've gotten quite used to sleeping on the living room sofa. I knew I was being taken for granted and not treated with respect. But, I couldn't bring myself to decide on divorce. I still had faith in Anthony. However, as expected, my feelings didn't reach him, and his treatment of me only got worse day by day. Hey, dinner. As soon as I thought he was asking for food. I can't eat this terrible food. He would complain. I suggested eating out a few times, but for some reason, Anthony stubbornly refused. Why? He wouldn't give me any reason. Anthony would come home from work, complain about the entrance being dirty or the toilet being dirty, and demand food. Since his attitude started to change, I've often wondered what I did wrong, but seeing Anthony's behavior up to now, I've concluded he's just using me to vent his stress. The contradiction between what he says and his actions, constantly finding fault and berating me, it's clear he's just venting. I understand Anthony is tired from work. But I'm human too. Being constantly criticized, I too accumulate stress. I had hoped for a change, but I've reached my limit. Hey, Anthony. Can we stop this? I gathered my courage to talk to Anthony. I don't know if it's because you're tired from work, but can you stop taking it out on me? I'm also stressed from being criticized by you every day. Anthony looked at me in surprise, speechless. Huh? What are you talking about? It's just like I said. You come home and immediately start complaining about me. I'm trying my best, you know? Anthony was half laughing as he listened to my words. But as soon as I finished speaking, his face turned red with anger. You know what? Who do you think you are? You're a housewife, but you can't clean or cook properly. What's wrong with complaining? Living carelessly like that. That's what pisses me off. Then, can you tell me what's wrong so I can fix it? No, I won't say. 
It's clear that nothing will change even if I tell you. You need to figure out what's wrong by yourself. Anthony evaded the question when I asked what was wrong with me. This conversation alone made it clear that Anthony only saw me as an outlet for his stress. Our relationship worsened even more after I expressed my feelings. The verbal abuse and attitude towards me intensified. I sighed, reminiscing about the happier times in the past. However, one day, I received a call from an unexpected person. It was my mother-in-law Jody. Jody and I get along well, but we don't call each other often, so I quickly answered the phone. Hello? Oh, Chloe, how have you been? Jody's voice sounded very cheerful over the phone. After some small talk, Jody brought up the main topic. Huh? Handmade? I was thinking I wanted a new hobby recently, and I remembered that you make handmade crafts. I was hoping you could teach me some stuff. Actually, I make handmade crafts as a hobby. I buy materials and tools, and spend time on my hobby when Anthony is not around. I had told Jody about my handmade crafts before, but I never thought she would remember. Yes, of course. If I can be of any help. That call led me to frequently talk with Jody. Our calls weren't just ordinary calls, but video calls. Initially, we just talked normally, but as I wanted to show her what I was working on and explain the materials in detail, we switched to video calls. Our houses aren't that far apart, but going there every time is honestly a hassle. When it's time for my appointment with Jody, I enter the room where my crafting tools are in craft while talking on the phone. My heart, which was distressed by Anthony's actions, felt purified while I was talking with Jody. By the way, how have things been with Anthony recently? Are you getting along? Yes. I'm glad to hear that. I didn't talk about Anthony to Jody. I didn't want to worry her, and more than anything, I wanted to forget about Anthony during the time I spent with Jody. Even after starting to do video calls with Jody, Anthony's attitude remained terrible. I was desperate not to let Jody catch on to anything about Anthony. However, one day, an incident happened. It was a few weeks after I started doing video calls with Jody on a Saturday. As usual, after finishing housework, I was on a video call with Jody when the door to the room opened. Anthony! Turning around, I saw Anthony standing near the door with something in his hand. Completely unaware of the video call, Anthony approached me. Hey, what are you doing here? What about the cleaning? The laundry? Why aren't you doing them? I've already done them. What are you talking about? Didn't you see? Huh? I didn't see anything. Well, he had been watching TV in the living room the whole time, so his response was expected. You're always just watching TV. What? Shut up. Anthony, further aggravated by my words, said. Get to cleaning the house already. Slaves don't get to rest. And then he splashed something he was holding on me. I soon found out what it was. It was beer. I was drenched in beer, smelling of it all over. And Anthony laughed at the sight. Shocked by the suddenness, I was speechless. If you understand, then get to work. Then, he kicked over a stack of books nearby. Anthony's mocking laughter filled the room. I couldn't take any action and just watched as the books got soaked with beer. But then, is that all you have to say? I heard a familiar male voice from the computer. Huh? Dad? Yes, the voice was that of Anthony's dad. My father-in-law, Liam. What are you doing? I saw everything. You verbally abused Chloe and then splashed beer on her. When did you become such a terrible person? It's a misunderstanding, Dad. That's not what it was. As Liam began to speak, 
The bravado from before was nowhere to be seen in Anthony, who now appeared completely cowed. Despite seeing Anthony like this, Liam didn't stop his anger. What misunderstanding? It doesn't seem like this was the first time, was it? Uh, what are you playing dumb for? Really, when did you change like this? Liam was clearly exasperated. It's understandable to be dismayed if your own son was doing such terrible things. Ignoring Anthony, who was just standing there with his mouth open, Liam made a proposal to me. Chloe, won't you come to our house right now? Right now? Yes. I'm worried about leaving you in that house. If it's okay with you, I can come to pick you up right away. I was honestly surprised by Liam's invitation. But, thinking about it calmly, staying with Anthony alone, I really couldn't predict what he might do next. Would that be okay? Of course. I'll be there soon. Anthony, if you do anything to Chloe, you won't get off lightly. With that, Liam hung up. I immediately started preparing to go to my in-law's house, waiting at the entrance for Liam to arrive. Anthony didn't do anything to harm me, looking uneasy instead. A few minutes later, my in-laws arrived and I headed to their house with them. When Liam opened the front door, Anthony looked frightened in a way I had never seen before, clearly very afraid of Liam. Anthony, you should spend tonight reflecting on your actions alone. Understand? Dad, I, uh, I'm sorry, I mean. What are you saying? The person you should be apologizing to isn't me, it's Chloe. Just think about what you've done alone. Reflect on it. Got it? Liam said this and led me outside. I had managed to change my clothes but didn't have the chance to shower. Liam wrapped a towel around my body and put me in the car. A few minutes later, when we arrived at my in-law's house, Jody was waiting for me. Chloe, are you okay? I'm sorry. Jody gently embraced my shoulder and led me to the bathroom. Take your time. There are clothes and towels here for you. Thank you. The events had unfolded so suddenly that my mind was still trying to make sense of everything. After taking a bath, I changed into the clothes provided and headed to the living room. Thank you for the bath. Don't mention it. Liam was looking grim, and Jody appeared concerned as they sat on the sofa. I took a seat on the sofa as Jody urged me to. Chloe, can you tell us everything that's happened up to now? Um, it wasn't the first time, was it? Well, please, Chloe. I didn't know where to start and kept silent. But my in-laws patiently waited for me to speak. A few minutes later, I began to recount everything that had happened since our marriage and why I hadn't consulted them earlier. They listened quietly until I finished speaking. And so, it came to what happened earlier. Why didn't you tell us? I didn't want to worry you. I'm sorry. Well, I understand how you feel, Chloe, but don't let that guys like him get carried away like that. I'm sorry. I was scolded, but I knew they were both worried about me. After a while, silence fell again. Both seemed to be pondering, and the atmosphere didn't invite interruption. After a few minutes of silence, Liam finally spoke slowly. Do you still love Anthony? What? I mean, Anthony is likely to repeat the same behavior. Maybe it would be best to consider a divorce seriously. Jody nodded in agreement next to Liam. Divorce. I had never expected Anthony's parents to suggest divorcing him. Certainly, it might be easier to divorce. But, could this be an opportunity for him to change? The dilemma of still being in love made the situation even more difficult. However, they quietly waited for my decision. After a few minutes of thought, I made my choice. I'll get a divorce. 
I decided on divorce. There was a part of me that wanted to believe in Anthony, but after much thought, it was clear he had never listened to anything I said before. If I didn't divorce and went back, he would likely return to his terrible attitude towards me again. That's what I thought. My decision seemed to have relieved them both. After some discussion, we decided I should file for divorce as soon as the next day. This way, I could finally be free from Anthony. Even though I had hoped for Anthony's change of heart until the very end, part of me felt relieved once the divorce was decided. The next day, I went to the house with my in-laws, holding the divorce papers in hand. As soon as we rang the doorbell, we could hear footsteps inside, and Anthony came out. Chloe. And dad and mom. Seeing the faces of my in-laws, Anthony showed an obviously disappointed expression. It should have been clear that I wouldn't return alone so soon after what had happened. We entered and sat down on the sofa. My in-laws also sat down beside me. Um. Anthony was still flustered and hadn't even apologized to me yet. Watching him, I said, Anthony, I want a divorce. What? Divorce? I've thought about it, and I no longer have the confidence to continue with you. If we start living together again, your attitude will just revert back, and over time, you'll forget about what happened this time and repeat the same behavior, won't you? That's not. Can you say for sure that won't happen? Besides, you haven't properly apologized to me yet. It's clear you haven't reflected at all from your actions. I'm sorry. Anthony quickly apologized after hearing my words, but it was too late. I had no intention of forgiving Anthony anymore. It's too late for everything. Just sign the divorce papers quickly. With my in-laws on my side, I could boldly express my thoughts to Anthony. Too late. Anthony, what were you thinking last night? Not even apologizing to Chloe and now you're surprised to be faced with a divorce. If you were aware of how terrible you've been, being divorced wouldn't come as a surprise. I did do terrible things, but I never thought it would lead to divorce. Not expecting to be divorced? You really have a blissfully ignorant brain. Anthony shrank back at my words. All his bravado seemed to have been left somewhere far behind. In the end, Anthony reluctantly signed the divorce papers. Our relationship ended without a single sincere apology from him. By the way, as I was packing to leave the house, I asked something that had been on my mind. Why did your attitude change all of a sudden after we got married? There was nothing like this when we were dating. Reluctantly, Anthony opened up. I didn't want to be looked down upon. That's all. Looked down upon? Did I ever act like that when we were dating? No, you didn't. Keep your weird fantasies in check. It's really unbelievable. Okay. With that, I left the house with my in-laws. Never to return again. I felt a bit sad to leave the house itself, to which I had grown attached. After filing the divorce papers, I stayed with my in-laws. Being a housewife without my own income, my in-laws told me I could live with them. Of course, I was nervous at first. But gradually, I got used to the atmosphere of my in-laws' house and could even enjoy doing handicrafts with Jody. During this time, Anthony tried to contact me, but Liam made it clear through my mobile phone. We're cutting all ties with you. And he never contacted me again. Anthony probably never imagined I would be living with his parents. Seeing that he tried to contact me even after the divorce, it was clear he still looked down on me. Divorcing such a man was the right decision. I can't thank my in-laws enough for encouraging the divorce. Now, a year after the divorce, I've started living on my own and working part-time, leading a fulfilling life. 
I felt it wasn't right to keep relying on my in-laws' house forever. Though I've moved out, I still keep in touch with my in-laws and continue to receive their support. They've treated me like their own family, even though we're not related by blood. My current goal is to repay my in-laws. What could I do to make them happy? Today, I continue to live with gratitude towards my in-laws. Mom's been in an accident and taken to the hospital. Please, take me to the hospital. I pleaded with my husband Fred, tears streaming down my face. I had just received word that my mother, Lisa, was involved in a traffic accident and is in critical condition, unconscious. However, upon hearing the situation, he said, I'm off to a company trip now, so it's impossible. And with that, he refused my earnest request. Even as I persisted, he just mocked me as if he were enjoying my misery. For me, the trip is more important. After all, visiting your mother, who is a stranger to me, is just a waste of time. I'm definitely not going. I am Michelle, 29 years old. I married Fred, a year my senior, two years ago, and we've been living a dual-income life. We met in the same university club. My club had many members, so it wasn't easy to talk to everyone but we became close after sitting next to each other at a dinner party one day. Additionally, we both discovered we were only children who grew up in single mother households after losing our fathers early, which brought us closer quickly. We started going out together often and naturally progressed to dating. After we both became working adults and got used to our jobs, he proposed to me. Both of us are fulfilled with our jobs, so we haven't thought about children yet. However, we do want them eventually and have talked about buying a detached house when the time comes. Currently, we're renting a condo and live close to our respective childhood homes. Since both our fathers have passed away, our moms, my mother Lisa and his mother Amelia, live alone and get along very well. They are close in age and have bonded over raising their children alone without remarrying. So, after our initial meeting before marriage, they became friends often having coffee or traveling together. I was surprised they became so close, but my mother looks so happy with Amelia, so I'm glad they met. Amelia is also very fond of me, and our relationship is good. However, Fred seems displeased that she prioritizes my mother over him. He has a strong mama's boy trait. Even before our marriage, I could tell he cherished his mother greatly, which I understood, coming from a single mother household. However, not long after we started living together, I saw his true nature. One holiday, my mother sent a message with a picture of her having lunch with Amelia. It's lunchtime with Amelia, the message read, accompanied by a photo of their smiling faces, which made me smile too. Hey Fred, looks like our moms are having lunch. Look, she sent a picture. I showed the image to Fred, who was at home, but he made a face in annoyance. What's this, some kind of harassment towards me? What? What are you talking about? At that time, I didn't know he disliked my mother. He was often quiet around her, but I thought it was because our marriage was new and he was nervous. I never imagined he'd resent her for being close with his mother. Because of her, mom has been turning down my invitations for meals, saying she has plans with Lisa. Doesn't your mom know how to show some restraint? I was shocked to hear he think like this and speak ill of my mother. Amelia seemed to have realized early on that he disliked my mother. During a dinner out with the four of us, Amelia scolded him for his sarcastic remarks towards my mother. Fred, what is your attitude towards Lisa? Enough is enough. What? Mom, you always take her side. You've always said I'm your precious son. It's not funny to prioritize someone you've only recently become close with over your own son. Fred argued back, but I couldn't help but find his attachment to Amelia abnormal. Later, when Fred wasn't around, Amelia apologized to me and my mom. I spoiled him too much. I'm really sorry. You don't need to worry about it. I don't mind either. He just loves you so much. My mother is a gentle and calm person, usually not one to get angry. Even now, she seemed to accept his behavior without blame, but I could tell she was hurt inside. And without considering her feelings, Fred worsened his attitude as days passed. 
Amelia defended my mother, so he never attacked her openly. But every time he saw my mother and Amelia getting along, he would complain to me, and eventually, he started badmouthing her regularly. Not long after our second wedding anniversary, I couldn't take it anymore and had a big fight with him. After a heated argument, we didn't resolve the fundamental issue, and since then, our relationship became awkward and our conversations decreased. Lately, he's been coming home late and going out alone on weekends more often. I thought it was strange and asked him directly. I'm just busy with work. Lots of overtime and weekend shifts lately. He said so. But I wasn't convinced and couldn't shake off my unease. Then one day. On that Sunday, both of us off work, Fred was packing in the morning. Apparently, there was no work today. As I wondered why he was packing, my phone rang with an unknown number. Picking up, I was surprised to hear it was the police. They confirmed I was the daughter of Lisa, then dropped the unbelievable news. Your mother has been in a traffic accident. I was stunned. She has. She was already taken to the hospital, unconscious and in critical condition. After getting the hospital's name, I ended the call with shaking hands. Tears welled up, and I struggled to think but knew I had to get to the hospital. But since I don't drive, I desperately asked Fred for help. Fred, it's terrible, mom's been in an accident and taken to the hospital. Please, we need to go now. But upon hearing that, he just looked at me with disdain. And, huh? I'm about to leave for a company trip. I'll miss the meeting time if I help you. Figure it out yourself. He flatly refused my plea. A company trip? I didn't know it was today. Now I understood the packing, but he had never told me about the trip. Moreover, I was stunned to hear it was a two-week trip. It's not the time for a trip. What if mom? Annoying. The trip is more important to me. After all, your mother is just a stranger to me, not related by blood. Visiting your mother is a waste of time, I'm definitely not going. He threw these hurtful words at me with a sneer. Move, I'm busy. I have a plane to catch. He pushed me aside, humming while packing his clothes in a travel bag. Furious, I said, You're the worst. Just do whatever you want. I left the house and rushed to the hospital by taxi. He left for his trip as planned. He had no idea what was happening back home. I tried calling him several times, but couldn't reach him for two weeks. Two weeks later, he returned home in high spirits. I looked at him coldly. I need to go give mom her souvenir. I wonder how she's doing. He said optimistically, but I didn't respond and just followed him quietly to his mother's house. On the way, he happily talked about the souvenirs he bought for Amelia. Not once did he mention concern for my mother. As we arrived and he was about to open the door, he paused. Huh? Why is it locked? He seemed puzzled as he noticed the front door was locked. Since Amelia usually didn't lock the door when she was home. Is mom not at home? He muttered. Pushing him aside, I took out the key to the Amelia's house from my bag and opened the door. Hey, why do you have the house key? He looked bewildered, but I didn't respond. Entering the house before me, he tilted his head in confusion when he didn't see Amelia. As he started towards the living room, not that way. This way. I called out to stop him. Leading him to a room in the back, its door wide open, we saw a brand new photo of Amelia. What? He was speechless, shaking as he stared at the photo. Then turned to me, almost crying. Hey, what's this all about? What's going on? I sighed deeply, holding back my anger, and explained. She passed away while you were on your trip. The funeral's already over. He glared at me, furious. Don't joke, that's impossible. Why should she die? Wasn't it your mom who was in the accident and in a coma? If anyone should have died, it's that old woman. I was disgusted by his insensitive outburst, but calmly told him what happened after my mother's accident. My mom woke up safely. She has a fracture and is undergoing rehab but is gradually recovering. My mother was still hospitalized, but thanks to medical professionals, she was alive. However, he was not convinced. 
So, why did my mom? I hesitated to answer. It seemed she was heading to our house on the day my mother had her accident. She was also involved in a car accident. And I asked, did you tell her about your company trip? What? I surely did. She was suspicious of you recently. You weren't in touch much. She probably wanted to check if you were really on a business trip. His eyes widened. Amelia had mentioned a month ago that he had stopped contacting her as often. And when she called him in emergencies, he'd either not answer or hang up quickly, claiming he was busy. Though she initially thought he was just becoming less dependent on her as he aged, she began to suspect he was hiding something. So, filled with distrust, she was on her way to our house to confirm the company trip, just when I received the call about my mother's accident. Amelia had passed away carrying some sweets she bought with my mother when they had gone out, likely planning to visit our house under that pretext. On that day, in my panic to get to the hospital, I didn't have the chance to inform her about my mother's accident. She probably walked from the nearest bus stop to our condo. She fell on the sidewalk and ran out onto the road. Due to the busy street, the approaching car slammed on its brakes but was unable to stop. An ambulance was called, but she had suffered a severe head injury. And then she passed away. After explaining all of those to Fred, I glared at him. After learning about Amelia, I called you so many times. For two weeks, no matter how hard I tried to reach him, he never answered his phone or responded to my messages. As there were no other relatives available to act as the chief mourner, I became the chief mourner and conducted her funeral. With my mother still in critical condition, I somehow managed the funeral without her actual son present. This past two weeks, you've been ignoring my calls and having fun, haven't you? I've come to understand your true character. I'm divorcing you. When I declared this, Fred collapsed to the floor, weeping loudly. How dare you? How can you say something like that right after my mother's death? Now's not the time for a divorce. And I didn't contact you because I was always with my colleagues, I had no time. Crying and making excuses, he only fueled my anger further. Stop lying! I raised my voice and took out a piece of paper from my bag, thrusting it in front of him. It was the itinerary of the company trip I found in his room. It says here the company trip was from the 12th to the 19th, a week. But you left for the trip from the 5th to the 19th. You said right before leaving that the trip was for two weeks. So, what were you doing for that one week from the 5th to the 12th? That is... I know what you were doing. You were cheating, weren't you? And you spent this past week with your affair partner, right? When I confidently confronted him, he stopped crying and began to panic. What are you talking about, cheating? Well, I took a week of paid leave and went on a trip with friends. You see, work has been busy lately, and I wanted a break. Sick of his continued excuses, I took out a mobile phone from my pocket. Seeing it, his face turned pale. The mobile phone was his, found in his closet while he was on the trip. He likely had another phone in his bag. Used specifically for communicating with his affair partner. He had claimed he couldn't contact me during the trip, but he left his regular phone at home, so it was impossible for him to notice any calls. You've been lying all along. You left this phone at home to spend time with your affair partner. I placed the mobile phone in front of him, and he began shaking, slamming his fist on the floor. Yes. I've been fed up with you for a long time. I have someone else I love now. He yelled defiantly and then. And why did you know where I hid the phone? Don't tell me you searched my room while I was away. His angry retort was exasperating. I glanced at Amelia's photo, apologizing to her in my heart for this display, and then spoke. Amelia told me. What? He stuttered. After a big fight with him over my mother, he started coming home late and often went out alone on weekends, claiming it was for work. As he became increasingly unreachable, I confided my suspicions to Amelia. She shared her own doubts and advised me. That boy always had a habit of hiding things inconvenient for him since he was little. Bad test scores, a glass he accidentally broke that his father cherished. 
he always tucked them away in the very back of his closet. If you see several towels there, he's probably hiding something behind them. After her death, I remembered her words, searched Fred's closet, and as expected, found the mobile phone. She told you that. He seemed deeply disappointed, realizing Amelia had doubted him. However, seeing his dejected figure, with this incident, I will be filing for divorce and seeking compensation. I'm prepared to consult a lawyer and take this to court if necessary. My heart remained unmoved. He groaned, hold on. But, realizing he couldn't escape the truth, reluctantly agreed. Subsequently, we properly divided our assets, and the divorce was successfully finalized. However, the following month, just as my new life began to settle, I received a call from him. Reluctantly I answered, and he immediately shouted, Michelle! Please, I need your help! What is it now? What happened? I asked about his situation, and it turned out he was in trouble at work because they found out about Amelia's funeral. He had Amelia enrolled in his company's health insurance plan, so he had to submit her death certificate to the company. That led to the company finding out about her death for the first time, and they realized the funeral happened during his company trip. He was seen as an unfilial and unreasonable man by his colleagues for not attending his own mother's funeral. But he blamed me, claiming I hadn't informed him about the funeral. However, it probably wasn't a good idea to rush and tell so many people. His explanations to his co-workers and to his boss were inconsistent, and his story changed every time he told it. His contradictions became apparent, and his lies were eventually exposed. Already seen as an unreasonable man, his repeated lies made him a pariah at work, and he resigned in disgrace. Now without income, he is living off Amelia's inheritance back at the family home. But the neighbors found out I didn't attend the funeral, and it's uncomfortable here. I thought about selling the house, but it's old and not selling. Apparently, the neighbors also see him as a bastard son, making it awkward for him to even walk outside. He had been planning to quickly sell the family home and move, but there are no buyers for the old house. I'm really in trouble now. So Michelle, let's start over. Remarry me, let's live together again. Hearing so, I was disgusted. It was clear he was only reaching out because he was in trouble. Don't be ridiculous. I'm done with you, I'll never remarry you. But please, I'm desperate. I don't care about you anymore. You should live with your affair partner. I firmly rejected him, but he seemed lost for words. No, actually. I've broken up with her. It turned out the affair partner found out about Amelia's funeral, and from there, learned she was the other woman. He had hidden his marriage, and the angry woman broke up with him, leaving him alone. That's your own fault. I wouldn't want to be with someone like you. Goodbye. As I was about to hang up, he quickly said, Wait! If you won't agree to remarry, I'll come to your house and talk directly. You're at your parents' house, right? However, no, I'm not. I replied immediately. Huh? Then where are you now? There's no way I'm telling you. Plus, I recently changed jobs, so there's no point in you waiting outside my old workplace. When I said goodbye, I told everyone that you might show up and to report you without hesitation. I decided to sell my parents' house to put some distance between him and me after this incident. With my mother's consent, we sold the house. As for her, she had recently been discharged from the hospital, but was deeply distressed by the loss of her dear friend Amelia. That's why we moved to a quieter place to live together peacefully. As a result, I left my old job and found a new one. Just tell me where you are, at least. I owe it to your mom, who took care of me all this time, to visit her. He was desperate to find out where I was, but his words infuriated me, and I responded with a chill in my voice that surprised even myself. Took care of you? After all your disdain for my mom, don't bother with convenient words now. Besides, mom said she never wants to see you again. What? Wait, Michelle! He was still yelling something, but I mercilessly ended the call. I then blocked his number and changed mine later. I later learned that he was struggling financially, 
apparently being sued for compensation by his affair partner for deceiving her. With no steady job, he couldn't take out loans and was scraping by with day labor and part-time work while looking for full-time employment. My mother and I, having started our lives anew, are now able to remember Amelia without the stress of Fred's presence. She couldn't attend Amelia's funeral and hadn't yet had the chance to place flowers on her grave and pray silently, due to our hectic move after her discharge. She's still struggling to accept Amelia's death, sometimes crying as she looks at photos and videos of them together. I really want to visit her soon. She said wistfully, so I replied, Yes, let's plan a visit to her grave soon. We're currently planning it, making sure not to accidentally run into Fred. Moving forward, I want to support her and enrich our lives in this new place.